Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CEO and Market Expert interviews. I'm your host, Lucien. Some of you know me as Triangle Investor from X or former Twitter. Uh, today, I am pleased to have in my show for the first time Mr. Jonathan Fisher, Cauldron Energy CEO. Cauldron Energy is an Australian-based uh, exploration and development company with uranium, nickel, copper. Uh, Jonathan will tell us more. Jono, welcome to my show. Thanks, mate. Good to be here. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Uh, my, my first timers always have to tell something about themselves. So, Jono, what is your origin story, your background, and how did you become a Cauldron Energy CEO? Uh, yeah, interesting story, Lucien. So, I, I do have a background in nuclear energy. I was in, in the sector in the UK. Um, but when I returned to Australia many years ago, um, you know, a bit of a rite of passage, um, there was no uranium or nuclear industry really to get involved in. Um, so I did general mining stuff for a while. Um, and my most recent claim to fame, and this is something that investors may not know, but it's really relevant, is I um, I did the approvals for and built Australia's first, actually the Southern Hemisphere's first radioactive waste repository. So right. we got that built in Western Australia, which is where uh, Baldwin's uranium project is. We got that built in Western Australia at a time when uranium mining is banned. And that's interesting because it gives me quite an insight into the workings of the WA government. Um, and, you know, every single um, WA department, government department that I had to negotiate with to get what is frankly the most complicated set of approvals ever in Australia um, mm -hmm. to get those through. So, um, yeah, it's it, it, rad and nuclear waste is a, is a, is a topic close to my heart. Excellent. Uh, which year was that? Um, so the, the facilities, it was um, approved in sort of 2018, 2019, um, and, you know, uh, construction commenced, uh, finished in sort of 2020. Okay. After that, you took the helm, it, uh, last year, you took the helm of uh, Cauldron Energy, right? Uh, that's right. Around January 2023, yes. Yeah. Actually, what happened? Uh, what, what happened with the old management? How come that you become a CEO? Tell us a, a bit well, more. Well, now if you've... I don't know if you've got any Perth or West Australian um, listeners, Lucien, but there is a story there. Um, Cauldron was previously a company associated with a chap called Tony Sage. Um, now, Tony is a very well-known mining uh, investor in, in Perth. He made a lot of money in, in a couple of things. And Cauldron was his uranium story. Um, but in 2017, when the, when the ban in uranium was brought in, there was a bit of a stoush in Cauldron and Tony left. Um, now that is, was a problem for the company because Tony was responsible for all the promotion and all the shareholder engagement yeah. and everything. And he just sort of, you know, he, he left. Um, the share price then was 30 cents. And, and over the next sort of five years, the company was sort of, you know, a new team took over, made some decisions that I probably wouldn't have done. Um, and the share price ended up at under a cent. Um, and so the board um, finally ditched that sort of other management team, um, brought in a new chairman, a chap called Ian Mulholland, who's very well respected here in WA, um, and brought me in as, as CEO. And, and with a, a sort of a, I guess, a recap um, that was done through Canaccord, you know, we found ourselves with a world-class uranium asset in a business that was capped at six million bucks. Um, should never have been that low. Um, but that was a sort of special situation we found ourselves in and I sort of, you know, have rebuilt the business from there. Okay. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. Uh, Jono, I want to hear your take on the current uranium market and especially your comment on the news from yesterday where we saw Kazakhstan government resign and of course, Kazatom Prom Q4 operations yeah. recently also. Your comment, please. Um, and, and look, anyone who follows me on Twitter or X, as, as it's now called, I, I have commented on this. Um, you know, Kazatomaprom and their production performance reminds me, I, I used to be in the iron ore industry, um, which was a booming industry in Australia um, uh, many years ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, Kazatomaprom's performance really reminds me of what Vale used to do to the market where they'd promise a big game, but just constantly underperform yeah um, which used to drive prices higher right and 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 the same dynamic seems to be uh, with Kazatama from these days now in terms of the management team um as uh, sorry the government um being moved on look i don't know 
Um, I'd be very interested to see, you know, how Western leaning and reformist the new cabinet is, um, because you know, you know, something I read said, well, 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 hey, the president is pro-reformist and he actually wants to, he wants to attract Western investment into the country, and the and the old government weren't doing it. But the other, the other, so it's the stealth Russian takeover. Um, what I do know, though, is is you know what it doesn't really it doesn't really message stability, um, which is what international and and, and rule of law exactly. um, what what other international investors are looking for. You know the other point to note, and and you know I looked at I've actually looked at uranium assets in Kazakhstan. Um, Kaz Kaz relatively recently brought in place a, a new mining law, uh, and they modelled those laws off Western Australia's mining industry. And our mining jurisdiction over here, and actually got our own our, the West Australian Department of Mines to consult on the implementation of those new laws. So, you know, they were doing some really good stuff um, to attract investment. And, you know, I, I, I guess from an international investor's perspective, hope that continues. From a uranium in, um, producer's perspective, I think the price is going to be higher for longer as a result of this uncertainty. Agreed, definitely. Uh, but do you see this as a coincidence that uh, they held a meeting with the uh, chief of government <laughs> yeah. a few days uh, with the uh, CEO yeah. of Kazatom from? <laughs> yeah, I, I, look, I, I read that on Twitter and, and I must admit I did laugh. Um, yeah. Hey, Kazatom from is a state relevant industry, right? So, um, you know, can't imagine that would happen in a jurisdiction like, like Australia, but maybe those connections are there and the weight is significant enough to, sure. to sort of drive that outcome. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, John, what about uranium equities? Uh, they are getting more attention, but still not all. Uh, uranium is more and more in the media. Do you believe that we have entered the period of more interest for uranium equities from funds and institutions for other uranium names besides chemicals, next gens and UAC? I mean, lower scale. Yeah, well, I mean, look, my own lived experience is yes, because, you know, the amount of inbound inquiry I'm getting now from um, investors um, and, and instos is is vastly uh, increased from what it was. Now, we've had a bit of an improvement in our market cap such that we're sort of in a spot where a small cap insto may consider us, we weren't before. Um, but, you know, every, um, every conference we attend, um, every industry event, um, you know the 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 interest in in you and, and in, in in Australia, you know we're a resource driven market here, right? The ASX is you know significantly weighted to resources. You've really seen this um, shift out of lithium as as a as as the the, the sexy story, um, you know, and into uranium and the amount of sort of you know lithium companies that seem to want to rebrand as uranium is is is, is kind of hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, so more interest, have we hit the peak? No, um, I think there's plenty of room to run driven by fundamental uh, imbalance Definitely. in demand and supply. And the fact that, you know, the, the, the physical uranium holders, if they are required to sell their stocks to satisfy spot, they're not going to do it at, <laughs> they're not going to do it at a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, I love the fact that you're active on X or on Twitter. For me, it will always be Twitter. Sorry if... Yeah, it's the same. same. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm. Uh, uh, you are pretty active, and I saw a couple of your tweets about uh, Deep Yellow. I know it's not your company, and you cannot comment on certain things. But what is happening with shorting the stock? Uh, John Borshov uh, and the company are pretty quiet lately. What's your take? Yeah, um, obviously John's a bit of a doyen of the industry um, over here. We um, we all know him. Look, I'm yeah. constantly surprised. Um, you know, the, there have been some sort of persistent rumours about capital raising, which which, which kind of helped the you know the case to reduce those shorts. I would have thought that they could they could use that as a covering event. No. Um, I wouldn't bet against John. Of frankly. course, no. Um, no. I, I reckon you. I reckon you're a brave a brave person to do that. Um, yeah. You know, John is. Um, you know, he's pro he, he's proved that he's a trooper. He keeps on he keeps on going, um, and I think they're going to have great success. Agreed, and I wouldn't bet against John either. Agreed. 
Uh, before we touch on the company developments and projects, I want to cover the jurisdiction that your company is operating in, and that is Western Australia. I'm not sure that everyone is familiar with uranium mining and exploration ban in some Australian states, so let's try to clarify that first. Where do we have bans in Australia and which kind of bans? Okay, so Australia Federation of States. Um, so the only the, the federally for the federal government, you know, it does touch uranium mining because you need an export permit. Um, and as long as you're basically not selling to North Korea or other countries that are not signatories to the non-proliferation treaty, that's that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but there is some federal involvement. But the the matter of mining the commodity is a state based issue, and and unfortunately we do have different. Um, policies and laws um, basically ac across every state. Uh, in, in the great state of Western Australia, which, you know, frankly, other than uranium <laughs> is the best mining jurisdiction in the world, um, we have a mining ban at the moment, uh, but not an exploration ban. So we can go and explore and continue developing a project and we will do that. Um, and that ban is a, is a policy ban of the government, is not a legislative ban. So, um, it can actually be changed pretty quickly. Um, as we move east, the next two um, two jurisdictions are the Northern Territory, which is not technically a state, it's a territory. I won't yeah. go into the difference. Um, and South Australia, both of those jurisdictions are open um, for exploration and mining. And obviously South Australia is where Olympic Dam is um, and and Boss Energy's uh, honeymoon project. Call out, call out honeymoon because actually there's a lot of similarity between honeymoon and and our asset at Cauldron, there's just a massive value of difference given that they're in a jurisdiction that currently allows mining. No. Um, the Territory's obviously got a, a history of, of mining um, with the Ranger uranium mine, a lot of good production out there. There's some significant assets in the Northern Territory, but they are sort of tied up in some forms of access difficulties um, given, given sort of Indigenous and, and Native issues. Um, going further east, In, um, commodities such as coal, um, but that's closed. So that is that is um, closed for exploration as well as production. Uh, and similarly, New South Wales and Victoria is a no. Okay, uh, let's discuss specifically the situation in Western Australia where you operate uh, your projects uh, when it comes to uranium and doing business. And please give us some uh, political update. Uh, what are you hearing? What are you? What is Give us give us some updates. Yeah, and, and listen, look, there's probably no one in the Australian market that is more active on this comp, on this sort of subject than me. I tend to I can talk about it a lot. So if I go into too feel much detail, feel free to talk a lot. Just, feel free. Just stop me. Okay, so the ban was enacted in 2017 um, when the previous prime, uh, premier Mark McGowan came to power. Before that time. Um, uranium mining was allowed in WA. So first first thing first, you used to be able to do it. It's not as if it's one of those jurisdictions where it's been banned for 100 years. Mm -hmm. um, Mark McGowan was a fresh-faced um, Labor. Um, uh, it's a, so I, in, in Australia, Labor is sort of you know socialist. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Premier, extremely popular. The guy had when he was in power, he had approval ratings that would make Vladimir Putin jealous, <laughs> right? I mean, ridiculous. Uh, had had people, voters in Western Australia, tattooing his face on their chests, like the guy was was a was an enigma. Now th that allowed him to do some stuff, um, and one of his policies was in 2017 he banned uranium mining, and he also at the same time banned the export of gas from onshore gas projects. Um, and he, so that was in 2017. In 2021, he had a re-election and even more of a majority. That was sort of tied in with the state's very harsh COVID laws. He shut the borders, um, which was a somewhat annoying um, a situation for the rest of Australia. Uh, but extremely popular in WA and, yeah. and massive landslide victory. Um, now, that's really interesting because what happened at that time was the green vote in Western Australia also collapsed. And all those green voters, so all those really left-wing voters, came in under McGowan into the Labor Party. So their left was probably more empowered than it usually would be in a steady state environment. Um, 
so that's all going along. And then sort of last year, uh, completely out of the blue, State Daddy Premier McGowan resigned. Um, look, there's some rumour and innuendo about why he did that. It was a little uncommon that he resigned and, and basically quit immediately without any handover. And, um, you know, no one saw that coming. Um, the new Premier is a chap called Premier Cook. Um, nice guy, uh, former health minister. Um but is not the same cult of personality that um, that McGowan was. Now, the reason that's interesting is because just immediately at, at that juncture, the odds on a change of government in WA massively shifted. Um, when you know, and and sports bed, they there are online odds you can check on this. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was it was at fourteen to one when McGowan was in power. The government was not going to change. Literally, the day he resigned, it came into nine to one. And then through subsequent, let's call it missteps of the new government, those odds of keep 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 coming in. And there's been a number of instances that have not gone well for the incumbent government in Western Australia, specifically some um, Aboriginal heritage laws, um, and 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 also a there was a, a national referendum on on Indigenous recognition um, in our constitution in Australia. It was called the Voice. Um, that didn't get up federally. Um, and whilst that was a federal issue, uh, the state Labor government was was sort of um, hit with that unpopularity. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some issues in the health department um, where the, 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 the government and the, and the premier have gone against, and this is really sad, they've gone against pediatricians' advice with respect to... Oh my God. to the placement of a new maternity hospital pediatrician saying, Hey, it should be next to the kids hospital. So there's the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit is right next door. Yeah. He's decided to put it 20 kilometers away. And, and, and you've had these awful headlines of, you know, 10 babies a year will be killed because of government. You know, it, you couldn't make this stuff up. So, so yeah. his popularity is, is, is let's, let's call it, he's, it's waning. Yeah. Um, but what that has and the, the final piece of the puzzle is about three months ago, the mining minister who had been in place since 2017, so he was an anti-uranium mining minister, um, he resigned. Um, and, and nothing nothing untoward about that. He just got to the end of his tenure. He's, he's you know, he'd been in government a long time. Now, he, he was an, a, an outlier in, in, in government because usually the mining minister will be from the right of the party. But he wasn't. He was from the left. He was from the green side and he was anti-Uranium. Yeah. Now, there's a new mining minister, David Michael. He's from the right of the party. That party is known as Progressive Labor. And, and that side of the party is known to be pro-Uranium. So you now have a, you, you've now got a pro-Uranium, you know, side of the party with the mining portfolio. And then you, you've got a new premier who is reassessing his priorities and wanting to make sure that he retains government. Now, so leave all that aside, and the opportunity that presents itself now is is that we. Some people say it was unforeseen. I, I would argue it wasn't. The decline in the nickel and lithium prices have hit West Australian industry very hard. Um, there have been mass closures of nickel mines. There are going to be more, and mass closures of lithium mines. So the first time in the last sort of twenty years the the right hand side of the Labor Party, which is is the fly in fly out workers, extremely highly paid but Labor voting, are worried about their jobs. Job security has not been an issue since the uranium industry uh, yeah. has been banned, and the the the, the argument there is well you, you need to assure the right of the party because if there's an argument between ideology and job security, I'll tell you who's going to win that, and ain't going to yeah. be ideology. People care about their jobs. So the, the the Premier is looking at this. I mentioned earlier that there were two policies that were brought in at the start of the 2017, uranium and also gas export ban. Well, lo and behold, the Premier is now reversing the gas export ban. And he's doing that and he's stated, oh, these are his words, not mine, his public rationale for justification of that. So doing something against the left of his party creates jobs. Well, that's good because jobs are under pressure. 
And secondly, he says, there is a moral obligation on Western Australia to help our trading partners decarbonize. It's better for us to increase our own emissions and, and produce more gas because it means Indonesia and others will burn less coal, right? So now that, that sounds very familiar because I have been pushing this argument to say, actually, that argument on, on, on emissions reduction, yeah, look, it does work for gas. It works a lot better for uranium, actually. And so the, 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 the Premier's own rationale is consistent with the policy uh, revision that we're proposing um, in, in WA. Okay. And okay. so that, 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 gas, that gas policy change has been brought about by, you know, the gas industry getting their act together, talking with government, uh, proposing a solution. Um, and, 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 and our approach there is to say, well, let, let's let that gas ban come through into law. Mm -hmm. um, that will still take a few more months, um, and then let's let's see, you know, how that can work work for uranium too. And the the final two points, um, the new mining minister I mentioned we had now um, has actually just been involved in in some industry crisis talks with the nickel and lithium industries to say, you know, how can we change things? How can government help you to make your operations more sustainable? And you know, it's going to be pretty damn hard to compete with Indonesian nickel laterite in the long yeah. term. Um, I, I think there's a there's a fundamental resetting of the competitiveness of the of the WA um, nickel sector. But the new mining minister was front foot, and he's he's there on record saying, "I'm willing to listen and I'm willing to reform." So that is an absolutely fantastic um, outcome. The second thing is that we are now in preparations for a. Um, election coming up in WA, they're fixed terms in WA. So that election is in March, 2025. And right now the Labor Party has a massive majority, huge majority. So the Liberal Party, who are the opposition, now the Liberals are pro-Uranium, bluntly out there. If the government were to change, they are pro-Uranium, happens very quickly. They're wanting to sit down and start setting their policies for the upcoming election. And knowing that they have to pick up a lot of seats, they are wanting policies which are daylight between where the current Labor government is and 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 where their proposed policies are. So um, uranium is one of those ones where they can, they can put a very differentiated policy in place. That creates a lot of jobs yep. and does good things for the environment. So that is a great, and there's, you know, there's employment benefits and multipliers because all sorts of other things that you need to, to do in WA. So that's great, great outcome. Yeah. Now, if you're playing a game here, you'd say to the Labor strategists, well, you know the Liberals are going to run on a pro-Uranium platform. What do you do in the next six months to take the wind out of their sails? Now, you either, you do one of two things. You either ramp up heavily the anti-Uranium and anti-nuclear sentiment or you go completely the other way. Um, so it's, it's really interesting time um, in uh, in the West Australian. Uh, yeah, that scene. was a really detailed uh, breakdown. Thank you for it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, great, great. I learned a lot. Believe me, uh, Australia's uranium reserves are world's largest, uh, with the, with around one third of global resources. Do you believe that with upcoming supply gap in this and the next decades, uh, we could actually see Australia taking first or second place in uranium production over Kazakhstan and Canada at one point in the future? Um, look, I, I think there's some other so really interesting things you mentioned there. So w one, every dollar that the uranium price goes higher is loss, more loss of revenue to the governments exactly. through their royalties. They know that. So yeah. the economic, you know, previously in 2017, there was no, there was no economic cost to the policy because none of the mines would have got up. And so you're saying, hey, we're banning uranium mining had no economic opportunity cost. Now yeah. it does quite substantially. Look, the second thing to note, and, and your, 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 your listeners may know this, that Australia has recently, relatively recently, decided to buy some nuclear submarines um, from, from the US and the UK uh, under an agreement called AUKUS. Um, they are going to be home ported in uh, Perth, half the national fleet, three of them, will be home ported in Western Australia. So Western Australia is having to develop a nuclear industry. They're even having to develop more radioactive waste storage sites and, and all sorts of other regulatory regimes. 
Um, now, there is a bit of political toing and froing going on around this. And one of the one of the suggestions is that the US may say, yeah, look, you can have our tech, you can have our subs, but you've got to open up your uranium industry because we need uranium from politically aligned nations. Um, you know, one call from Joe Biden or Donald Trump, whoever it ends up being, yeah. to the Australian Prime Minister, that would make an interesting conversation. You know, now I, I told you previously that actually uranium mining. US president calling an Australian prime minister, what impact could that have? And, and um, while we are a federation, um, there are lots of um, federal funding arrangements whereby the feds in Australia kind of nationalise things that are, that are state-based issues. Um, we're a lot more federal than, for example, the US. And so there are certainly funding pressures where a federal government could try and get national security interests to be considered in it by a state, um, a state government. Yes. So the, it's not, you know, that that's not the craziest um, conspiracy theory that I've heard. Now, just a step, final point on politics, because I've told, I've said all the reasons why I think it should change. What's really interesting, and you've got to listen to both sides of this, you listen to the side that don't want uranium mining in WA. And, and, and the main union, workers' union that is against uranium, against uranium in WA is called the AMWU, the Australian Metal Workers' Union, um, Australian Manufacturing Workers' Union. Um, and their, their state secretary and I may have had a little bit of a tiff in, in the media. Now, his argument is that Uranium is no good for mining. It's the next asbestos, um, which seems a little bit out of touch. Um, and, and, and if anyone has read my articles, I do go into that. Um, what is also interesting, though, is that he is the state secretary of the AMWU. That is a national union that has a South Australian branch of the AMWU. Funnily enough, the South Australian branch of the AMWU happens to be strongly pro-uranium because their workers are the ones at Olympic Dam. Their workers are, are at Honeymoon. Their yeah. workers are the ones that are actually going to build nuclear submarines in South Australia. Um, and when you look at the South Australian industry, you know what? Those workers are really happy. They've got high job satisfaction. They've got high job security and they're extremely well paid. Um, so... You know, very interesting situation where the same national union, which is meant to be ideologically aligned, has a completely different state um, policy as to the one in South Australia. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, John, let's move to your projects. Uh, the first one is Yan Ray. Did I pronounce it right? Right, Yan Ray. Yep. Yan Ray. Okay. Yep. Yanri Uranium Project, uh, it's an ISR project, uh, as I read. Uh, you announced uh, project exploration target a uh, few weeks ago, a few days ago. Please tell me more about this project. What is the current status? What are the plans? Expand a little bit on the project. Yeah. Um, so the first, the first thing was just before Christmas, we did release a scoping study on Yanri. Um, for an initial one and a half million pound um, uh, per annum production rate. We had to cut that back because the ASX doesn't allow us to use inferred resources um, in, 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 well, uh, only a limited amount of inferred resource um, in, in a scoping study. So that's a smaller um, project than we would like. But the, look, the scoping study is, it was an absolute ball terror. I mean, ISR asset, it's right. Yeah. Low CapEx, low OPEX, you know, the IRR, um, I think we reported an IRR about 80% based on an $80 price. You know, at current spot, you know, your IRR would be probably, probably through 100%. So it's extremely attractive. Um, but, it, you know, that that scoping study only had an 11-year mine life because, again, we, we had to restrict the amount of resource um, that we used. We have 31 million pounds uh, in JORC, Joint Ore Reserve Committee um, Classification in Australia. Um, so then we we released a exploration target that says, well, you know, how much do we think is there? Now, to be clear, that exploration target focuses 
on Bennett Well, which is our where our initial thirty one million pounds is, and and Bennett Well surrounding area. Um, and 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 that said, there's up to fifty million pounds in that. Um, but if you read if you read the fine print, that fifty million pounds was generated through about twenty targets, but only half those targets did we actually put any tons and or pounds and grade against. So um, half them we zeroed out just because you know from a um, from a, a risk perspective we didn't have sufficient data there to put anything in. Um, but some of those are pretty highly prospective targets. And so what, what I would like to say is, yeah, look, that exploration target might have said 50. But if you if you decided to put some numbers against some of these really interesting ones, you know, you can see a lot more there. Um, the final point is the Yanry targets are very big. Uh, the Yanry tenements are very big. Bennett Well and Surrounds is only a small portion of it. The Paleo Channel system there is enormous. And it actually goes up and we intersect with the Paladin Meningini uh, asset, which is also another ISR asset. We've got contiguous tenure with them. Huge paleo channel system, a lot of uranium there. Um, that is a world-class, world-scale um, paleo channel system. Um, and, you know, we, we're going to be out, we're going to be out drilling that this season. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's great that, you know, we've got the support to go and do that. That was one of my next questions. Uh, what are... Uh... Th that next drilling campaign, do you have some rough numbers on the budget, on the meters drilled, uh, et cetera? Yeah, I, look, I think in that um, exploration target, we said we drill 25,000 meters. Um, people should remember, uh, this is not the Athabasca Basin. We're yes. drilling rotary mud and we're drilling down to 100 meters through soft sediment. Like I'm not saying it's a knife through butter, but it's really cheap to do it. Yeah, um, it's so different. totally 20, different. Totally different. Twenty five thousand meters shouldn't scare people from a budgetary perspective. Um, you know, you know the argument is, and that's on one rig. Like the argument is with the with the U price where it is today. Shit, why don't I put a second rig on and drill fifty thousand? You know, that's that's really where it. We we will obviously <laughs> actually probably do a bit of sonic as well. Um, just to recover a bit of drill core because, you know, that helps us with the planning. Um, we've obviously done scoping study, next stage is PFS. And, and, and obviously we, we do have some old diamond core from, from previous drill campaigns, but most of it will be rotary mud where you don't, you don't recover physical samples. We will do a bit of sonic, probably sonic, um, to make sure we do get some core that we can do some other tests work on. Okay. Uh, for an average investor who is looking at this project and he wants to know the time frame of developments on this project, can you say approximately in two year time frame, what are you planning to do on this project? So n number one, you know, investors should be um, confident that the current policy in WA does not hold us back, right? So we are, able, and, and that is different to Queensland. We are able to go and drill and we will be absolutely drilling and expanding that resource and doing our PFS and all that kind of good stuff. Um, you know, ideally, you know, people used to think until relatively recently, people would say, oh, we need a change in policy. Uh, we need a change in government in WA to get a change of policy. Well, the, you know, the next available date is March 25. <laughs> and so one thing is let's drill the hell out of it such that in March 25, we're the best position um, mm -hmm. to go forward. But I've just explained a whole lot of reasons why actually a change in government is is possibly no longer needed because of all this stuff going on internationally and on macro thematic where even the current government is now, you know, possibly m more amenable to, um, you know, changing the policy. And I, I won't, I'll be, I'll be a bit careful about what I say around of course. actual um, government engagement. Um, so, you know, we will be mm -hmm. drilling as much as we can um, we will be delivering that PFS. Um, we, we, we will be doing um, a, a, um, a field leach trial. So we've done um, leach trials with the CSIRO, which is Australia's peak scientific body. And we do need to do a field leach trial. We'll probably do that. Um, you know, that is probably better to, to wait um, until you've sort of got a lot more of those samples and, and, and really understand that ore body um because essentially you want to you want to avoid the hydrocarbons in an ISL 
uh, ISR asset. Um, you know, there is some lignite in our deposit, just as like there is lignite um, at honey, Honeymoon. And you want to understand, it's patchy. You want to understand where it is, because obviously that can affect your leach results. Um, so, yeah, look, there's lots of work to do that is not held up by the policy. Okay. Um, and we keep it pushing forward. Uh, okay, uh, let's move to your Melrose uh, Nickel Copper project. Uh, please tell me the status of this project, uh, the plans for this project. Give us some data. Yeah, so look, um, we picked up Melrose last year, probably before there was really heat in, you know, so much heat in the uranium industry. Um, we picked it, picked it up for a song. It cost us next to nothing. Um, now, it is a it is a nickel, but polymetallic um, project. And, you know, currently we get no value in our share price for it. I'm pretty sure of that. We have just conducted a, 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 um, a drill campaign. There are some results pending. Look, I'm confident that A, this is not our, it won't be our focus. It's not going to distract from uranium. But I am confident that we'll actually get some value in the share price for it because, <laughs> you know, our strategy there will be to farm it out to a major um, on the back of these drill results. So um, I just, you know, want to be uh, assure people that, um, you know, it's not, it's, not, it's not a distraction. But I do like the project and let me explain why. Um, sure. it's in the West Yorgan, which is a pretty good region of WA and um, relatively it's pretty close to the Chalice Julemar asset, which is a very large nickel PGE project um, that, well, in, until until six, mo six months ago when they released a horrible PFS, um, you know, they were kept at several billion dollars. Now they're, now they're much lower. Um, but we are chasing a sort of a Julemar style um, of deposit. And the, re the thing that attracted us to the project is, is we inherited a lot of drill data uh, from a group called Independence Group um, who, would, who drilled the area in 2006, 2007. And what, what we had is air core drilling only down to 50 metres. Um, and so there's geo geochem drilling, right? Um, and at the bottom of that 50 in a certain area, look, it was picking up 0.47% nickel. Now, you know, not great. Nickel yeah. grades, but there's some other stuff in it. But interesting. And and that aligned with some historic aeromagnetic data that we looked at. And so then what we did is we actually did some inversion modeling. So usually or historically aeromag was two-dimensional. You could see it, but you couldn't tell how deep it was. Hmm. So we did inversion modeling, which for the first time was able to put a 3D model on onto that aeromag data. And what that showed is that the, the anomaly, the magnetic anomaly, is about 100 meters deep. And so the 0.47% the, the nickel we were getting at 50 meters, it was not into this anomaly. It was still a sort of a halo of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that, that's important because nickel is not the most mobile. It's not like uranium. It's not the most mobile of elements. So... You know, you expect that if you're getting you're getting halo grades at 0.47, you expect that the source is quite close. Yeah. Um, and um, the the other important thing was that the the, the magnetic signature that we were picking up uh, was not a strong magnetic signature. It was a sort of a moderate one. You don't want a strong magnetic signature if you're looking for nickel sulfides because you're probably going to find mag magnetite. Um, so you want a you want a moderate magnetic signature, which we had. We then did some. Um, air, airborne electromagnetic surveys as well as some ground loop EM and we found EM uh, electromagnetic anomalies consistent with the aeromag, consistent with the geochem. Um, and so all of that was kind of suggestive that we might be sniffing some nickel sulfides. And so we have just finished that dr initial drill campaign where we're peppering this anomaly initially with shallow geochem because it's cheap and we want to sort of understand where that halo is. Um, and we haven't released the data. So we had an XRF gun on site. XRF is actually pretty good. When you're looking for nickel, it's quite reliable. Um, and what we did is, 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 is shoot each of the samples with the XRF. And if it said, if the XRF said something interesting, we're like, well, we'll send that to the lab. Well, we sent 872 samples to the lab. That is a lot of samples, number one. Um, and two, what we showed in the 
um, announcement is actually we found some sulfides even even ab above where this main anomaly is. Now that's didn't expect that, um, and so that was that was pretty 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 good. I was quite happy with that. Um, you know we and and uh, you know I can't you know we do have readings for for those um, XRF. Um, results that were used to prioritize the samples can't say what they were we decided not to to release them because okay. releasing actual xrf data is a little bit you know that's probably not best practice so we okay. didn't do that um but those results are at the lab and they're pending and you know what i can say is i'm confident we'll get value in the share price for it we don't now so that's a good outcome are your labs faster than the canadian how long does it usually take to um uh they that you know in 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 recent living past lab lab delay has been a real issue yeah. um but you know i mean what you're finding in wa like i've had i reckon i've had five drilling contractors contract contact me in the last week alone looking for drilling work now that never used to happen right it was the other way around trying to find a rig was insanely difficult um the tide has turned on exploration in wa obviously with nickel and lithium activity coming down. Um, I hope that is reflected in lab turnaround times. Don't know though, but I think we, we expect a few weeks. Okay. Uh, what about drilling costs? Uh, do you have approximate, like you said, uh, now there is more available uh, drilling companies. So did they uh, uh, reduce their price of drilling? Uh, do you have any per meter cost of drilling right now? Look, you know, um, all in less than hundred bucks a meter. Okay. Yeah, I would think, you know, okay. there and thereabouts. Um, it's not, you know, this is not Athabasca territory, right? Like it's, it's, it's shallow and that's air core. Air core is cheap. Um, our next, you know, we may well, we'll either look to farm out this project on the basis of the results we just do, or, or we we have talked about actually, after we've done that, popping down a few um, RC holes. Um, now they might go down to two or 300 meters and really get into that anomaly. So we'll just have to see how all that works out. Because again, it'll only be a small RC program, but um, you know, we may well do that in the in next month or so, depending on, on not only the results that they come back from the labs, but the discussions that we have with, with potential parties on farming. Okay. Farming Good to know. Things. Okay. And, and, and those discussions are happening now. Excellent uh i wish you luck with that of course uh let's move uh, to river sand projects tell me more about this project um look you know i mentioned that there was an interim management team came in and they did some things that i wouldn't have done one of them was bought by that river sand project okay. um i i like rivers i like sand the global sand market is a really interesting market um but it's not our focus and we'll be looking to move those on as I did with the gold asset that I also bought, sold that, um, sold that a few months ago. So the focus going forward will be on uranium at Yanri and a bit, a lot of exploration there. We'll get some value for Melrose one way or the other. And uh, Hey, we're looking for more uranium projects and, 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 um, you know, we have a really good technical team. Um, they are thorough, and conservative and don't jump at shadows so there's a lot of crap um <laughs> projects and neurology and other shit that you see um we, we're looking through a lot of them haven't bought anything yet but okay. you know hopefully we can uh, we can find something else as well yeah that that's great you made this clear so your focus is solely uranium you will uh, uh get rid of those other projects that are non-uranium projects and you will stick with uranium that that's good enough for me to hear yeah uranium is a focus look nickel as i said will farm will, you know most likely farm it out you know okay. might there be some involvement will i still do some stuff sure it's not but it's not a focus why not why not if it's a good project yeah definitely i agree uh i want to talk a little bit about the share structure uh tell me more about uh your share your numbers of shares outstanding uh do you plan to do some uh, split stock split maybe or something? What what's the plan here? Yeah, uh, so we've got one point one billion pieces of paper out. Um, you know, current share price I think today is four point two um, to give a market cap around forty five million. Um, 
So wouldn't want to have any more piece of paper out there. So wouldn't do a stock split. You know, people might ask us about the reverse of consolidation. No, I mean, I um, meant re reverse. Yes. Yeah. Um, not minded to right now. Um, you know, one of the one of the things on ASX is you know you want to be above ten cents, frankly, um, because that's when your share price can move in half cent increments. Whereas below ten cents, it's point one. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that matters to, to investors and traders. Um, you know, we're, we, I think our 12 month high uh, about four weeks ago was 5.8. Um, we're 4.2 now with a lot of interest and a, and a lot of good news flow coming up. So I think we'll be able to, uh, you know, punch through that barrier without having to do a consolidation. Um, we also have, and you know, this is something of interest for investors. We have a lot of options currently uh outstanding that are in the money and they're starting to convert through so there's there's about 280 million options roughly um what's the average price uh there's there's a chunk of them at, at 3.4 cents and a chunk of them at 1.5 and most of them at 1.5 so basically if all of those convert across you know there's probably about 5 million bucks of of cash that comes into the business um the 3.4 cent oppies actually expire. And so they're in the money, they expire in March. Um, so, you know, you're expecting some of those, you know, those to come through and, you know, we're dealing with uh, exercise forms all the time. And on the ASX, it's a real pain in the ass because every time you get get someone exercise, you have to put out a cleansing notice, um, which just clogs up your, your announcements inbox, you know, your announcements box on the ASX with all these silly compliance things. Um, so they're, they're short dated. The 1.5 cent oppies, um, they're December 25 expiry, but because they're so in the money, and when it, when an oppie is so in the money, actually the um, the time value kind of um, dissipates, um, and actually you're seeing a lot of those convert across too because you know people want to have access to the underlying stock, mm -hmm. um, you know. So that's you know, and that that has been a little bit of a cause of our, us coming back a little bit on the share price because you've seen a lot of conversions. There's a, there's a few profit takers that were there. Um, you know, what I'd say to people is, you know, with Cauldron, you're getting, you get market leading liquidity. We lead the market on the ASX in the Uranium Juniors for liquidity. That is kind of driven by a lot of my proactive um, Definitely. Investor Definitely. outreach. And, and, you know, you've got confidence that they'll continue. And, you know, when I talk to, to, to I don't, I obviously don't spend my whole life on Twitter. You know, I, I'm very proactive at talking to all the brokers, um, uh, in Australia and literally, um, you know, thousands of them get emails and content from me as well directly. Um, and, and what they want to know is, you know, a private client advisor at Canaccord or, or one of the other brokers, they want to know that if they put a client in there and shit happens, they can get out. And, and that, you know, a lot of the time, the problem with juniors and you is, is you don't have that liquidity. Um, well, we do, and, and that's not going anywhere. So that that should give uh, investors a bit of confidence in 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 sort of having a sniff. Yeah, that brings brings me to another question. You said you are you're promoting your own company on Twitter, etc. But do you have any other promoting activities? Companies doing some promotion at the moment? M me? No, you. Uh, I mean the company. Uh, sorry, I ask that in a different way. Do you have some promotion companies uh, engaged in promoting your company? Oh, no, absolutely not. So, look, um, w when I joined, um, the company did have a um, engagement with a group called Proactive Investors. Yeah. Um, that's lapsed. Um, and I have used some sort of PR, IR firms to do things like I actually got them to redo our website. I think the website's great. Well done. Yeah. Um, but no, you know, I, I refuse to let those PR, you know, those kind of firms do my social media because, you know, I, I just don't see how a 25 year old generally female marketing officer, they can't give you good content on uranium. They don't understand it. Agreed. And therefore, if they can't, if they can't do good engaging content, you know, you're not going to go anywhere on that medium. Um, and so the thing I have done is I've started writing news articles um, that I publish on Twitter, but also get published through mainstream um, <laughs> publications. And that, and their macro thematics 
But at the bottom is, hey, John, is the CEO of Cauldron, and you get a lot of eyes on the stock, right? Um, and so, you know, all of that, that's free. That, that's, you know, well, you know that they, they just, they love, I, I, I honestly don't understand, maybe there's a little hint out here for other junior CEOs, I do not understand why more people don't do it, because as a junior, you know, you are absolutely trying to scrimp and save for every dollar, right? I mean... You know, funny story. So I'm from Perth, but I live in Sydney. Every time I go back to Perth, which is probably every two weeks at the moment, I literally, I stay with my parents to save the company money, a fly economy. You know, you 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 just don't spend money when you don't have to. Um, and these proactive, not proactive, and that's not fair on them, these, these professional kind of companies, they're expensive. And I don't think you necessarily get the engagement. Um, I, I was I was at a conference the other day. Some chap comes up, he's, he, he runs one of these things and it was part of the conference that you get a, um, you know, you get a, uh, a three minute prezzo that he would post to YouTube. I'm like, oh, fine, did that. I checked the week later, it got four views Ooh. on that particular one. And Same how time, much? How much does he charge his? Uh, well, service? that was all part of the conference, right? Oh, okay. I, I don't know, but at the same time, a another more social media savvy uh, person came up. I did the same three minute speech. She posted it to Twitter instead of YouTube. You, you can very easily waste your money in that kind of thing. And, and, and for me, if you're able to produce content yourself, um, then, 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 you know, you get that exposure for free and you can put more, more money into the ground. Fair enough. Uh, but I believe that some promoters that know uranium are good promoters, but I, I, I agree on that, that ah. a person that promotes a company has to know, pr promotes uranium company has to know not a small they had to know a lot about uranium that that, that is something that we agree yeah. on definitely yeah uh, no, no, no. and and I, and I will say the uranium community that we have on on twitter and that is a whole range of leading accounts it's yeah. fantastic it's fantastic it, you don't get that in other in necessarily in other commodities yes. and it's it, it's great yeah they, they, they are calling us that we are a cult <laughs> uranium well, cult well, i'm yeah, glad but... i'm in it not outside it yep yeah uh you mentioned money uh how much money do you have in the till not you personally i mean the company uh yeah so so we announced so we've just put out our quarterly so the december balance was 1.3 million i think we said as well that since then of the 5 million i was talking to 300 and something thousand um has already been converted across and i think we also mentioned that we hold another few hundred thousand of of listed equities in other juniors that, that is not ideal frankly that was a um a, a, a construct of history with with tony sage um from back in the day um you know that that obviously we shouldn't i, I don't think we should be holding equities in other listed companies um mm -hmm. so that's not a long-term thing um so you know we're not at all, you know, and 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 with with, with options consistently being uh, exercised, um, you know, we're not we're not at all stressed on capital. Look, the other thing I'll say is, um, as part of the last capital raise, we did. I brought on a a, a, a family office uh, investor as our new number one shareholder. Um, they're a uranium focused family office. They are a they have made a lot of money uh, in in backing uranium names. Um, they backed Boss. They are from uh, Australia. Plus. Yeah, they're from New South Wales, from Sydney. Um, and you know their thesis is the same as my thesis, which is, yeah, well, they backed Boss because they love ISR. They see us as the next Boss as soon as the policy changes in WA. And in their view, same as mine, the policy changes in WA as it you know back to what it used to be. It's just a matter of time. And they're a money multiple investor, right? And they're sitting there going, look, if it takes six months, two years, five five years, whatever, however long it's going to take, I don't think it's going to take that long. Um, but they're quite relaxed. And actually, they just say, look, you know, we will fund you. 
put as much money into the ground as you reasonably can. You don't have to worry about money. And what the 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 the, the, the head of that, he's actually posted this to, to, to Hot Copper, which I was I was a little bit surprised about. But you know, um, investors can go and read that to them by themselves. That's you know that that's that's there in, in black and white. That you know they're highly supportive of us. They bought on market, um, and and you know we is a really nice situation to be in where you know you've got you got such support from your major shareholders so so uh, he's uh, they are the, your major shareholders uh, who else uh, i think you... i think they're number one yeah okay yeah. Uh, w w what's the other uh, shareholder breakdown uh, how much of uh, the shares are retail and how much do you have yeah. bigger holders so the, let's say the, the, the top 20 would be about 64% you know so sort of standard um, as a consequence of history um there is there is shareholders two three four and five maybe mm -hmm. um are, are a block of chinese shareholders um you know wonderful people um <laughs> you know um they're mainland mainland um private in individuals um property developers and others um mm -hmm. you know get, get on great with them uh only problem is that you know like in australia you're not allowed to smoke in 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 bars and 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 at restaurants, well, these guys still do. So my clothes end up always stinking of, of cigarettes. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's um, you know they they are they are there is history. Um, they're not uh, any representative of the Chinese government or anything like okay. that. So I just want to be plain to private say that. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Private people. Um, and um, you know, as, as I said, it's about sixty four percent for the top for the top twenty. Okay, what about skin in the game? How much do you hold personally the management? Um well, now I'm gonna have to do the math on that, but approximate um, numbers. Five or six percent. In total, percent. management in total, you mean? No, no, that's me. Um probably twelve percent. Okay. Give or okay. take. That's a good um, number. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, well incentivized um, to, to to align. I'm not going anywhere. This is, you know, this is me. Um, um, uranium, uranium is a once in a life. This is a a a a a perfect storm. If you're not in the uranium game now, you should never be. So you know, um, agreed. I'm really excited. I'm really excited. Yeah. Yeah, uh, two more, and then I will leave you. Please give us some names. Who are the people behind the Cauldron Energy? Who is in your team? Uh, so, the chairman is a chap called Ian Mulholland. Now, Ian, and it was one of the things that attracted me to Cauldron. He is an excellent geologist, very well respected. Uh, he was the MD of a, of, a, of a couple of other ASX companies. He's one Explorer of the Year. That which is a very high honor, um, obviously in the mining and exploration industry in WA, um, and he's you know he's a chairman who adds value. Now, I, I give you an example: we were able to internally deliver our scoping study um, because the chairman took the reins on that. You know, I don't have a chairman who just sits there doing silly government stuff. He adds value. He's brilliant. Um, it also happens that he's a really nice guy. Um, you know, we have a no dickheads policy. Am I allowed to say that? We have a no dickheads policy. I like working with people. We have a great team. And and that comes, I didn't have the best experience in my last role. Um, and so it was really important for me to, to work with people that, you know, were just good blokes. Um, and so that, uh, that that's Ian to a T. Um, I have hired an exploration manager, a guy called Angelo Socchio. Um, Angelo is Brazilian, the most passionate man of, of, of talking about rocks you can imagine, um, and and has a history of discovery. Um, and then the the sort of the CFO, executive director, of finance um, is a chap called Mike Fry, who who has um, who's been around ASX and compliance and and capital raisings for longer than I could imagine. Um, and and you know he you know we we're able to run that office on the uh, i'll say it again we run on the office on the smell of an oily rag um you know he, he can do everything in that respect um so uh yeah i'm really really happy with the team probably looking to hire a couple more people in, okay in, in due course yeah you mean geologists or finance guys 
not finance guys. No, <laughs> geologists. Okay, I have to uh, ask. Geologists, project managers, project directors, that kind of thing. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, final question. News flow from the company. What can we expect? Expect when can we expect in the last in the next let's say six months? Yeah. Um, look, the 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 the, the, ne the next most the nearest term thing coming out will probably be these nickel results, right? Because I'm hoping, you know, they're close. Um, you know, word to the labs there, you know, um, hurry up. Um, so that, that, that's happening. The second thing is obviously we are planning a very major drill campaign um, up at Yanri. Um, that will necessitate a few announcements beforehand, as well as periodic announcements as we're drilling, because it'll be quite a long campaign. And again, key to note on that, when you're doing rotary mud, so you, you test it, you don't, you recover a sample, you downhole probe it. So literally, I mean, with some quality control on your data, but literally the moment the probe's down there and the nerd with the laptop is, is doing his thing, you have results. And so that means that you can periodically report progress. You're not, it's a lot easier to do that than, than you know, I don't have to wait to the end of the, the, the program to, to, to do that. So there, there can be periodic um, news on that. Um, and the other thing obviously is, is, um, there'll be some new flow, hopefully about some new people joining uh, as, as to support the uh, uranium um, and new project development. And uh, yeah. some news from uh, about the river sands, right? Yeah, yeah, and 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 asset divestment. Yeah, and and you know, I I think in each release I've said yes, those those discussions are going on. It's a bit of a strange um, those those sand assets. There's, I won't go into the details, but it's a bit odd. Okay. Um, but yeah, we're having we're having those discussions, and 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 hopefully we, you know, and again, any money you recover from that is free money because there's zero value ascribed in our share price. So, yeah. you know, I hope to be able to get some money and put it straight back into the ground. Uh, I wish you luck with all that. Uh, that was Jonathan Fisher, Cauldron Energy CEO. Jonathan, thank you for coming to my show, and let's catch up sometime soon. Awesome, mate. Thank you.